Okay, hi everybody. Rabbi Kelman was not able to attend this class, he did the other ones, uh, but he asked me to tell you all that there is an amazing program, spring program, and uh, check out the classes, and there really, really is a very nice lineup. Uh, what we are going to do in this series, a uh, series of five, I'll give a, a very, very brief overview. Uh, let's go to share screen meanwhile. Um, this is very uh, natural for this time of year. Okay, uh, you feel it in uh, Chutzlaretz, but you feel it very, very strongly in Israel this post-Pesach month, uh, and particularly the week 10 days that is from today, which is Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day in Israel, until Yom HaTzma'ut, with, can, containing with it Yom HaZikaron, Memorial Day. Um, this has gotten the name uh, of, uh, in, in recent years, Mishoah Kuma. not so much in recent years, uh, from Holocaust to redemption, to, to rising, right, to nation building. Uh, and it's a very powerful, it's a very emotional time here in Israel. Uh, from the most mundane things, there are just flags everywhere, to turning on the radio and hearing stories today, all day long, radio, Facebook, TV, uh, Holocaust survivors, and over the course of the week, hearing stories about fallen soldiers, uh, about uh, communities that are being built up, about Zionist stories. So it's really a very powerful time of year that continues through to Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day, a few weeks later. Um, and it's really a time where we have, if Pesach is, you know, our first nation building, uh, then uh, this this time, this month of ER is our second nation building, our return to Zion, uh, the second time over. Um, and it, it's really something that is very worth talking about. So what are we going to be doing in this course? We're going to have five sessions where we're going to start today with the beginnings of Zionism, the reasons for Zionism, the earliest uh, aliyot, mostly the first aliyah. We'll talk a little about the second aliyah. Next time after Yom Atzmot, not next week, but in two weeks, we're going to do uh, from the Ottoman Empire to the British Mandate, uh, the emergence of Hebrew, new art, new Hebrew culture, uh, and of course, the, the battles to create nationalism, to create a Jewish nationalism and Jewish self-defense. Our third class is going to be about the War of Independence and the actual creation of the state. Uh, and then we're going to deal with Israel after the state has been created. Class number four, the challenges of the first decade, mass aliyah, building an economy, religion and state, so many different questions. Uh, and finally, we'll do a class on the, uh, the, uh, the steps that go up to the Six Day War and what happens in the Six Day War. So that's the basic outline of the class. Um, so like I said, today we're really gonna talk about Zionism and the first aliyah. Um, first Aliyah is interesting, and we'll look at the dates in a second. It's not really the first Aliyah, right? If you think about it, throughout Jewish history, there has been Zionism and their proto-Zionism, let's call it that, right? Uh, and forms of Aliyah, the Ramban, right? Nachmanides is already saying that a Jew must live in the land of Israel, and he comes and he moves here. And we definitely have movements to come and live in the land of Israel, but as a political movement, as a modern movement, and as a movement not just to come and live here, but to to create a state, okay, that's already coming into something new and something different. Um, and that's where, where we're going to be talking about. Uh, first of all, practical Zionism, right? The first Aliyah is maybe not the biggest or the most successful of the Aliyot, but it shows that it's possible to come and to live here in the land of Israel and to create something new. Um, and it's many years, we're going to see, it starts in 1882, it's many years before Herzl and political Zionism and the first Zionist Congress. So that's just a, an interesting, uh, an interesting distinction between coming here, facts on the ground, building something, and political Zionism attempting to get permission from the Ottomans, from all sorts of other governments, uh, to get a charter. Right, all these things that Herzl works towards that don't work so much, okay? but uh, political Zionism. What's the picture? It's the flag, but it's not the flag, right? It all look, it looks familiar to us. Uh, but of course, the modern Israeli flag is only blue stripes without a white in the middle. It doesn't have the word Sion in the middle. This looks really much more like what the flag is based on, the Talit. Um, and this is the Betsy Ross of Israeli flags. Okay, This flag was created. It's the first flag that we know about. It's the first Israeli flag that we know about. It was created in 
Rishon Lezion, uh, which is a community of firsts, as we're going to see Rishon, the first of Zion, but it's first in many, many different things. And this flag was already made in the um, in the 1880s for the community of Rishon Lezion. So that's just uh, it was a nice difference between the regular flag. So let's take a look at the timeline for a minute. Um, so the timeline includes both the old Yishuv, meaning Jews that are here before the first Aliyah, because Jews have always been here. There really has never been a time period where there weren't Jews living in the land of Israel, obviously waxing and waning. And there are periods where there are strong Jewish communities and periods where it's really at a low, but there always are Jews living here, including the middle to late 19th century when Zionism begins. So our first, uh, our first few things on the timeline here are really about the old community, the what's called the Yishuv HaYashan, right? The, the old Yishuv, the old settlement here. So already in the 1850s, the old timers are creating new things. 1854, we have a new Jewish community in Moza outside of Jerusalem. They're not staying only in the traditional cities that we're going to see, right? And I see already questions. I hope this is not a question about sound. I'm just going to look for a second. Yeah, so um, there should be source sheets on the site. There always are. Um, I gave them out yesterday. So if you can get them now, wonderful. If not, you'll get them later. Um, and questions, please put in the chat and we'll look at them at the end. Okay, so we have a new Jewish community in Moza outside of Jerusalem in the 1860s. We have a movement outside of Jerusalem's old city, the first neighborhoods outside of the city. In 1870, we have the very non-Zionist organization, very Jewish, uh, very good for Jews, but not Zionist, the Alliance Israelite Universelle, the French Jewish organization, uh, which helps Jews all helped Jews all over the world. Actually, I think it still exists. Um, and they found a school in Israel, Mikveh Israel. We're going to see they're influenced uh, by Rav Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher. Um, there are attempts to settle Petach Tikva in 1878. All of this is before the real official beginnings of Zionism. Okay. Then we have what I'm going to call the push. There's also a, a pull, but there's a push to create Zionism, and that's the anti-Semitism that is happening in Russia, in Poland. Okay, uh, 1881 pogroms in Russia, not the largest ever, but it was a very, it was a shocking moment because it was a feeling that reforms are starting and things are getting better. And suddenly there's this wave of pogroms, um, May laws that limit Jewish residents to the Pale of Settlement. We're going to talk about all these things. Uh, and this feeling that there has to be a different solution. Okay, that if perhaps uh, progressive Jews had thought that they will become part of the new societies and the lands they live in, many of them wake up to the fact that that's not quite going to happen. And that's when we get the first Zionist societies, this organization called Chovevet Zion. And that naturally leads into the first people making Aliyah, right? Official movements of Jews coming to the land and wanting to start new communities. Okay, yeah. so we have the first yeah, Aliyah. 25 to 35,000 yeah. people, give or take. And by the way, when we hear these numbers, I just want to mute people. Is everybody muted? Let's just make sure. Um, yes, I'm muting you all. Um, when we talk about these, uh, these numbers, assume that they are not numbers, not everybody stayed, right? Some people stayed, a lot of people turned around and got back on the boat because they were kind of shocked by what they found here. And that's true for the first Aliyah and the second Aliyah. Um, 1882, we have this very seminal text, Leo Pinsker, the, one of the founders of Chove Vetsion, writes a book called Auto Emancipation. It's also the very first group, Bilu, leaves for Palestine. The first communities, Rishon, Rishon Lezion, Zichon Yaakov, Rosh Pina, okay, followed by other communities, Gidera, Mazker, Batia, Bat Shlomo, all of them with the assistance of Baron Rothschild. We'll talk about him. Uh, very important in terms of understanding Judaism and Zionism, right? How do we live in this land as a Jewish state and make it work? And that's the, going to be the question of the Shemitah controversy that we're going to talk about, the first Shemitah controversy. They continue, don't worry, there's more than one. Um, but this question of here Jews have been living not in their own land for centuries upon centuries, and suddenly they come back and they want to be masters of their own destiny. 
what happens with Jewish law? How does that work? Which is still something that we're dealing with today. Um, so that's Shemitah controversy. All this happens before the first Zionist Congress, before Theodore Herzl, before uh, he writes the Jewish state, before he convenes everybody in 1897. So there's quite a lot that happens before Herzl. Herzl is not the beginning. He's important, but he's not the beginning. Um, in 1900, Baron Rothschild transfers his support to the JCA, the ICA, okay, instead of giving direct his own overseers, there now is a, a organization that is uh, basically run by the colonists themselves. Um, and 1904 to 1914, and we'll talk about this a little now and more in the next session, the second Aliyah. Okay, so that's just to give us a sense of the broader picture uh, of the time. Okay. Um, and uh, let's talk about the, the reasons why Zionism, Zionism begins now, because we all know, right, from the Sidur, from Jewish sources, from the orientation and the decoration of the synagogues, Jews never forgot Zion, right? Jews always thought about returning to Zion, whether their situation was good or their situation was bad, right? If it was good, maybe they didn't want to return so quickly, but it was definitely there in the back of their minds. And certainly when their situation was bad, they thought about coming back to Jerusalem uh, and reestablishing themselves. But there is no real serious political and migration movement until the late 19th century. And the question is why, right? And, and, and I call it a push uh, and a pull, okay? The push is the rise of anti-Semitism, okay? Alexander II, the Tsar of Russia, is assassinated. Up until then, there are some reforms in Russia. Russia is, is very much behind in terms of the Enlightenment and making their Jews citizens, unlike Western Europe, where, of course, we also have anti-Semitism, uh, and that's what's going to push Herzl, the Dreyfus trial is going to push Herzl towards Zionism. But this is anti-Semitism going on in Russia. Alexander II is assassinated. There's a wave of pogroms, 1881 to 1884. Okay? Um, and we also have the Pale of Settlement. You know, anybody who's watched Fiddler on the Roof, read Shalom Aleichem, right, or knows anything about Russia at this time, Jews are confined restricted to where they are allowed to live, although the Russian Empire is very large, Jews are restricted, there are quotas on what they can, uh, professions that they can have, there are, they are not allowed to vote, there's no space, there's no jobs, there's no food. And this, of course, begins the mass migration of Russian Jews, of Eastern European Jews out of Russia, most of them go to North America, right? Most of them end up on the Lower East Side or various other incarnations of the Lower East Side. But there are some who say, no, 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 we want to go to our, we want to create our own country. So that's the push, but we also have the pull because realize that in the middle, middle, of the, middle of the 19th century, from 1848, revolutions all over Europe. Nobody really wants to be part, uh, nobody, but most people don't want to be part of a multinational empire anymore, the Ottoman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? Napoleon's empires. They want to be part of their own nation state. And this is happening in Italy and in France and in Germany and in Poland, right? Everybody wants their own nation state with their own culture, with their own language, okay? The picture on the left is of um, the, the riots in Vienna in 1848. On the right, of course, is the Italian flag because the Italians don't want to be just the small little city-states uh, of Rome and of Venice. They want to be an Italian nation. And Jews are influenced by this as well, right? If everybody else wants their own nation state, well, what about us? We want our own nation state as well. Now, this is going to clash with Jews who are being freed by the emancipation, right? Movements in Western Europe to make Jews part of the larger political body, right? In France and Germany, various places to make Jews full citizens, which might be true in law, but is not necessarily true in people's attitudes and people's hearts. There's always these questions of dual loyalty, okay? Um, and Jews want more freedom, but they still feel more anti-Semitism. And so many of them are pulled towards this idea of creating their own new nation. There's also the question of assimilation. As Western Europe opens up, as more and more Jews are allowed into professions and universities and living wherever they want, right? And they don't have to be in the ghetto anymore. There's a very strong trend towards assimilation and even conversion, right? I, I don't want to be part of this group anymore. Now I have the freedom to go wherever I want. How do we keep our identity 
that's going to be party part of the story of creating a Jewish state as well. We're going to talk about Ahad Ha'am towards the end and his feelings about this. Okay, so these are these are some of the causes behind why this is emerging now of all times. Okay, but we have early Zionist thinkers even before this. Um, surprisingly, some of the earliest Zionist thinkers, and there's a two that we're going to profile here, Yehuda Alkali and Svi Hirsch Kalisher, are religious Jews. Now, why do I say surprisingly? Right, we say religious Zionism very strong, certainly in Israel today. Why surprisingly? Because the religious approach was not necessarily to take uh, redemption and return to Zion into our own hands, right? The more conservative approach is the Messiah is going to come. We're all going to be brought back on the wings of eagles. It's going to happen miraculously, and God is going to do it. And until then, the decree is that we have to be in the diaspora. And this was definitely a strong approach by religious Jews up until the Holocaust, and for some communities even after the Holocaust, and even today, um, to say we have to be proactive and to create our own state, that's not necessarily something that naturally goes with religious Judaism. And yet, we have these two characters, two very interesting characters, very, very traditional Jews, both of them rabbis, okay? uh, Yehuda Alkali, who's on the left here, um, and they're actually both coming from places where the movements for nationalism are very strong. Yehuda Alkali is a rabbi, he's born in Sarajevo, Okay, he's a rabbi in Semlin, Serbia. Okay, these are all part of the Ottoman Empire, but they very much want to be their own nation states, right? Serbia, Croatia, it's very complicated, but that's what they want. Okay, um, and when there's the terrible blood libel in 1840, there's a blood libel in Damascus, uh, Yehuda Alkali says, this is enough, we need to create a new state, we need to have a national home, uh, and he's very practical. He doesn't say we need to pray and it's going to happen. He says we need a fund to buy land, we need to collect uh, maser, tithe money, we need to have a great assembly. Assembly, a lot of ideas that Herzl, by the way, is going to adopt. And he writes this book called Gorala Hashem, right? Um, a lottery for God with very, very practical ideas. By the way, interesting historical note, a, um, somebody's grandfather lives in Semlin and is very influenced by Yehuda Alkali, and that's Theodore Herzl's grandfather knew Yehuda Alkali, knew a lot of his ideas, and it's probably no surprise that many of these ideas are taken up by Herzl a half a century later. So really fascinating thing. He writes this pamphlet in 1857. Uh, he is memorialized in Israel in a town called Or Yehuda, in the center of the country. Hey, our other rabbi, almost exactly contemporary, Rav Tzvi Hirsch Kalischer, hey, um, he lives in Poland, Prussia, right? The borders keep changing all the time. And he writes a pamphlet called Drishat Sion. And he says, we must help ourselves and not wait for divine help. He says, this is the redemption that the prophets spoke about. And we need to collect money and we need to buy land and we need an agricultural school. And he's the reason that there is this Mikveh Israel. He speaks to Allianz and he says, we need to have a Jewish agricultural school in Palestine. And he also gets memorialized in the community named Tiratzvi. So that's Tirat Zvi in the Beit Sha'an Valley. So these are two seminal thinkers long before Herzl. Um, and someone who comes along a little bit later and is really the, the guiding force behind creating this organization of Chibat Zion, Chovevet Zion, lovers of Zion, uh, is somebody who's very not religious. He's very assimilated. This is Leo Pinsker. Uh, he's a doctor. And that's actually very interesting because his way of looking at anti-Semitism seems to be very influenced by his medical training. Um, let's go back a step. Okay. Uh, in his youth, he was very much into Jews should become true Russians, very assimilated, not at all religious. When the pogroms hit, he is extremely disillusioned. This is a society that we want to join. Uh, and he decides he has to understand this anti-Semitism because the world is getting better, more modern progress. What's going on? How can it be that there's still this anti-Semitism in the world? And he writes this pamphlet called Auto-Emancipation, where he basically determines that anti-Semitism is a disease, right? It's fascinating the language that he uses. By the way, I didn't bring a lot of the sources, but anybody who's interested in this stuff, the text that you have to get, well, two texts today, okay? the original text is something called The Zionist Idea, uh, edited by Arthur Hertzberg, where he had 
has excerpts from all these guys, right? Everybody. Um, and then there was an updated version published only a few years ago, um, uh, collected really by somebody named Gil Troy, who brought in all kinds of new thinkers that were around since Arthur Hersberg wrote his book. So the Zionist idea and the Zionist ideas is the second one. Um, but Leo Pinsker writes about anti-Semitism. He says, Jews frighten people because Jews don't have a natural home. And therefore people see them almost as ghosts, like living ghosts. And that's why there is something that he calls Judeophobia. He doesn't use the word anti-Semitism. He says Judeophobia. And he really looks at it like a sickness. And he says, only when we become a living nation again, right? Only when we are able to have our own state and then we'll be a living nation, then anti-Semitism will end, right? Unfortunately, he was wrong. <laughs> on that count. Uh, but that was his analysis of the situation. Uh, less, you know, Herzl, when he writes the Jewish state, right, 15 years later, he really writes about creating a Jewish state in order to physically save Jews. Pinsker is writing and saying, no, we can actually end anti-Semitism by creating a Jewish state because then we'll be normal and people won't be frightened of us. So it, it's a fascinating analysis. Um, he dies in 1891, but his remains are brought to Israel. And that's where you can see his grave here, right next to the grave of Menachem Uzishkin, uh, who died in the 40s, who was the head of the JNF of Karen Kayemet. The two of them are buried on Mount Scopus. Uh, the only two uh, modern leaders buried in an ancient burial ground archaeological site on Mount Scopus that Uzishkin wanted to be the national pantheon uh, of Jewish leaders, their cemetery, didn't quite happen because in 1948, Mount Scopus was captured by, uh, was surrounded by the Jordanians. We'll get back to that in the War of Independence. Um, Okay, but Leo Pinsker. So Leo Pinsker begins Chovavet Zion, this uh, movement, the lovers of Zion, many, many small groups. Um, if you look in this picture, by the way, interesting picture, um, all right, it's the class picture of the Chovavet Zion. So these two fellas, right, Pinsker, you should recognize, we already pointed him out. And next to him is this very religious Jew with a nice long beard. There are actually a lot of people here with nice long beards, some of them religious Jews, some of them not. Everybody had a beard in those days. But you can tell the more religious ones by the caps. The guy next to him is somebody named Rav Shmuel Mohiliver, who is also one of the founders of the Chovetzion. Rav Shmuel Mohiliver, 1824 to 1898. He's a rabbi in Bialystok. Um, and he joins the Chov of Eitzion, even though really there are a lot, it's largely a secular movement because he says, if there is a fire in your home, imperiling, if, if fire had taken hold of our homes, imperiling our persons and our property, will we not receive anyone gladly and with love, right? And his approach, similar to Rav Cook a few decades later, right? Everybody has to work together because we are in desperate straits and we need every Jew and we have to create this new movement. Um, now, one of the fruits of this new movement, a lot of these, the, the Chov of Eitzion society spend a lot of time sitting around and talking. There's a lot of talking. Jews like to talk, right? And there's a lot of debating and what's the way and what's the road and how should we do it? But there's a group of Jews who say, uh, enough with the talking, we're getting on a boat, right? And that's Bilu, okay? Bilu, as you can see, the, the symbol of it here, right? Bilu, bit, yud, lam, and vav, which is taken from a verse in the book of Isaiah, Beit Yaakov Lechuv House of Jacob, get up and walk. Uh, many people point out that they left out the end of the verse, which is Be'or Hashem, in the light of God. They are very not religious, these guys, um, even though many of the first Aliyah are religious. And they say, we have to get there. We have to come to the land of Israel. Let's take a break from the new Zionists and look back at the land of Israel and what's happening here meanwhile, right? What was here already? So we already mentioned the new Yishu, the old Yishuv breaking out of the old city of Jerusalem, building new communities. Let's take a look at what are the facts on the ground here. So first of all, we're under the rule of the Ottoman Empire, who have essentially um, neglected the country in a terrible, terrible way. If at the very beginning of the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century, they develop a lot. By the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire is on its last legs. And certainly the land of Israel is, and Palestine is not a priority for them. Jews are living largely in what's known as the four holy cities. And I just really like this map. So I brought it because I just bring it whenever I can because it's a fun map. Okay, four holy cities, which is, of course, Jerusalem. Hebron, 
uh, Tiberius and Spot. Do not use this map to drive with. It is really not going to help you very much. Okay, but it's it's a nice map because it shows you all the different holy places in all of these cities. Why these cities? Jerusalem and Hebron, we can certainly make a strong argument for their holiness. Tiberius also, right? The Masora, the rabbis, Spot, uh, much later. But these are considered the four cities because these are where Jews lived, right? Um, these are where Jews lived throughout, right? Very, very rarely were there no Jews in these cities. And certainly in the 19th century, Jews are living here, but they're already starting to move out. They're starting to expand. And if you look at the numbers, right, the numbers are growing. Uh, Jews in the land of Israel, 1870, only 18,000. By 1880, 27,000. By 1890, and this is already partly the influence of the, of the Aliyah, 40,000. And by 1914, 85,000. So the numbers are really dra dramatically uh, growing, uh, maybe not as as dramatic as they are today, but definitely dramatically growing. Um, the community is mostly Sephardi, although there are Ashkenazim as well. Uh, there's an Ashkenazi rejuvenation with the students of the Vilna Gaon who come in the beginning of the 19th century, settle first in Sfat, and then move to Jerusalem and reestablish the Ashkenazi community in Jerusalem. Um, they move out of the old city. Okay, they create new communities like Petach Tikva, uh, or attempt to create Petach Tikva is kind of a failure. And Motza, they are starting to move out of Jaffa, right? And that's Nevei Tzedek, not Tel Aviv yet. We're not up to that. Uh, but we definitely have growth and movement. Very, very traditional community, okay? Traditional in terms of its religious observance. Um, but with some inclination towards change, towards development, which partly is going to be pushed along by the first Aliyah, and partly they're going to clash, as we're going to see with the Shemitah controversy. Okay, another player uh, is the Alliance, as we mentioned, right, this Jewish aid society based in France, helping Jews all over the world, not in a Zionist way, but establishing schools and orphanages and trade schools, right, um, and they are convinced uh, by Kalisher to create an agricultural school in the land of Israel. Okay, today, Mikve Israel is this kind of fascinating like little island in the urban sprawl of Gush Dan near Cholon uh, in Tel Aviv, but it's this beautiful little green preserve. Uh, the founder is somebody named Yaakov Karl Netter. Okay? And just to show you how not Zionist they are, they were not allowed to teach in or speak Hebrew till 1915. Okay? The classes are in French. We'll talk about Hebrew in the, in the next class, but the classes are in French. They, it's an agricultural school. Uh, they do all kinds of agricultural experimentation. Uh, and it's kind of a Jewish outpost. And it it hosts Zionists, even though it's not Zionist, right? What do I mean by that? When Herzl makes his famous trip to the land of Israel and he meets with Kaiser Wilhelm, right? His one meeting that he has with him, which takes about 10 minutes long and Herzl considers to be very significant, it happens in Mikveh Israel. When the Biluites first come to the land of Israel, they don't know where to go, they go to Mikveh Israel. So they're not necessarily supporting Zionism, but Zionism comes to them. Okay? Uh, in the picture, you have the uh, restored and really beautiful. It's very worth going to visit Mikveh Israel. It's still a functioning school today, by the way, um, a boarding school, but it also has tourist sites. Um, and this is the restored synagogue, very beautiful synagogue. Um, and on the right is the, uh, is the winery. Okay, that's here. So this is what's here. Now, who shows up? Okay, first of all, here are the first communities of the first Aliyah. Not all of them, but a large number of them. One of the things I want you to notice, and this is going to be very important when we get to talking about the British and 1948, is the settlement pattern. Okay, where did Jews move to, right? So some people used to call it Migadera Lechadera, right? But that's, it's not only Migadera Lechadera, but basically it's here along the coast, okay? Cutting across the Jezreel Valley, more of those in the second Aliyah, and up into the Galilee, right? A nice N shape. That's the early settlement. Why is that the early settlement? That's a fascinating question, okay? It basically goes back to the Crusaders and the Mamluks hundreds of years earlier. When the Mamluks in the 13th century defeat the Crusaders, the Crusaders had created beautiful cities along the coast, Ashkelon, Jaffa, Caesarea, Akko. The Mamluks say, um, we don't want these Crusaders coming back. 
and they destroy those cities. And the Arabs essentially move inland and the coast turns into swampy garbage land. Same thing with the Jezreel Valley. Also, not because of the Crusaders, but not worked by anyone. And when the Jews are looking to buy land and they're willing to pay pretty much any price, eh, the absentee landlords, the Arab absentee landlords, who are not living in Israel and Palestine for the most part, they're living in Beirut, they're living in Damascus, they're living the high life in other places. This is the land they wanna get rid of. We don't want this land. You wanna pay top price? Fabulous take it, right? And that's why the settlement is here, even though traditionally throughout Jewish history, Jews lived in the mountains and non-Jews lived on the coast, but the settlement pattern flips in the first Aliyah. So that's just interesting uh, to notice. And that's going to change in the 20s, in the 30s. Eh? But this is the early communities, the early Yishuvim. And we're going to be focusing, uh, we'll talk about Rishon Letzion, Ekron, which gets a new name, Mascara Batia, uh, and Zichron Yaakov. But of course, there are many, many other stories to tell here. Um, so who are the Bilu and what's their story? Okay, so the Bilu come to the land of Israel. Um, now Bilu is a, they had a very strong impact in morale, in mentality, but a very negligible physical impact. Just if you ask average Israeli, you know, how many people came with the Bilu? Bilu is like a big name here. They'll say, oh yeah, hundreds, many communities. There were 12 men and one woman. I always wonder what that one woman felt, right? Uh, you gotta wonder. Um, and they came to the land of Israel. They don't really, know what to do with themselves okay and they're very excited they're very idealistic but they're very very green and they also have no money so first they go to mikveh israel okay um and mikveh israel we'll talk about in a minute but they work them very very hard um this is their anthem, okay? Take a look at their anthem. It's fascinating, Hushu Achim Hushu. This is like one of the first Zionist songs, but listen to some of the words. Hushu Achim Hushu, Narima Pa'amenu. Let's go, my brothers, right? Let's hurry. Let's get our, our you know, lift our feet off the ground. La'eret avotenu to the land of our fathers. Lo lanu ha-menucha, lo lanu ha-margoa. Not for us is rest and, and peace. Be'eret ha-krucha v'shilton ha-zroa in this bald land with the, the might, where might makes right, okay? Okay, but then listen to what everybody's saying to them. Re I be hatelu. My friends are all making fun of me. Malacha eretz marasha. What are you going to do with this land of uh, your your ancestors? Sham iyim yilelu. It's all empty and howling. Tor lacha eretz chadasha. Look for something new, right? And then going on to the next column. Imi be mifatzeret. Jewish mother guilt. Ana bni al tashlicheni. My mother begs me, don't leave me, my son. Biltecha ani oyani sheret. I'll be here all alone. Umlala. Lonely me, Tmechani, who's going to take care of me? No, we're going no matter what. Otina Balta Atri, you can't stop me. So Unes Tiona El Irenua Hamuda, lift up a flag towards Sion to our, our precious city. Kiel can't confeyo nana aleha reyuda. On the wings of doves, we will go to the mountains of Jerusalem. But it's a pretty ambivalent song. Nobody wants them to come. Okay, they're coming because they think this is right, but everybody is against them. Now they come to Mikveh Israel, uh, and the the, uh, the head of Mikveh Israel is this guy on the on the left here, Shmuel Hirsch, uh, and he is very disdainful. He thinks these guys they don't know anything. They're very idealistic, but they they don't know what to do. And he keeps testing them and giving them more and more work. Uh, and we actually have a fascinating book, uh, a diary written by one of the Biluites. His name was Chaim Chisin. I don't know if you guys can see this, a Palestine diary. He obviously did not write it in English. Um, and he writes about his experience. And, and one of the things that I found very powerful is how it's so not what his expectations were, right? When we sat and dreamed about this back in Russia, this is not what we thought was going to happen, right? And here he writes, this is August 1882, not long after they've arrived. I have written nothing for 10 days. It was physically impossible to write because my hands were so bloodied and blistered that I could barely open my fingers. When I was in Russia, I dreamed I would work eight hours a day, 
and spend the rest of the time in intellectual work again. But the intellect cannot function under these conditions. How can you use your mind when your back aches as though it were broken, when fatigue is so terrible that you only want to eat your supper as fast as possible and drop into bed? This kind of fatigue comes from being totally unaccustomed to this kind of labor. I started working on August 12th. This entry is August 21st. Okay, so they were really rather unprepared for what is going to happen to them. And this is true of a lot of the people of the first Aliyah. They're full of dreams, they're full of ideas, but the reality is a very harsh awakening. Um, Mikveh Israel does not work out for the Bilu. Some of them join with the settlers of Rishon who are not thrilled about them because these Bilu guys are very secular and Rishon is a traditional religious group. We'll talk about them in a minute. Um, and some of them go off to create Gedeira. Okay, this is land bought by the JNF. They don't have two pennies to rub together. They can't buy land, but the JNF buys it. Um, not by the JNF, excuse me, the Chovei Tzion, okay? uh, very little is left. Today, Gedeira is, is a thriving town, a small town. Uh, very little is left of the original Gedeira Bilu buildings. The, the building here on the left is one of the original houses, uh, shacks. Okay? They had no building permits. The Turks do not make this easy for them. Um, they lived together till 1888. Today, there's a, a museum. That's the picture on the right here. This nice house, Beit Mintz. Uh, why is it so nice? Because it was built in 1925 by one of the original Biluites, whose name was Moshe Mintz, who gave up, went to America, made some money, and came back, right? By the way, Chaim Chisin, same thing, went back to Russia, became a, uh, became a pharmacist, and only returns in 1905. It's very harsh. It's very difficult. Okay? Rishon Lezion, okay, they are the first. They are the first in everything. They're the first community. Uh, Tuba Av, right, July 1882, they come to the land that they bought. Uh, they buy land in a place called Ain Kara. Okay? They think it's going to be great. They, they don't know anything about land. They don't know anything about water. They don't know anything about agriculture. Uh, they buy this land, Ain Kara. There must be a spring here because it has an Ain in the words. We're going to see it takes a while for them to get some water. Um, eventually, they're going to need help, like everybody from Baron Rothschild. Um, eventually, they become the center for the area, and they are the first of everything. They have the first flag, like we saw. Uh, the national anthem is written here. The first Hebrew school uh, that was held in the synagogue. That's the picture here on the left. The first orchestra. That's when they start to do a little bit better. They have an orchestra. That's the picture here on the right. Um, uh, and... Um, a lot of different things that they are really the first in. Um, many of them are religious, they're middle class, their families, we're gonna see the second Aliyah is very different, okay? Water, what are you gonna do without water? They dig down 48 meters, 150 feet until they finally reach water. This is without you know serious equipment. This is in 1882. Um, the Baron Rothschild sends them money for a pump to bring the water up, but they finally discover water, they create this water, Tower, and this is now in the center of modern Rishon Lezion. It's actually a very nice museum. It's very well historically preserved. But these, all these communities, have a very hard time finding water, finding land, making a go of it. And the person who essentially saves them from starvation uh, is Baron Rothschild. Okay? Baron Edmund Roth, Edmund de Rothschild of the famous Rothschild family. Uh, most of the Rothschilds are most definitely not Zionist. Uh, some of them are not even very Jewish. They assimilate, they convert. Uh, Edmund de Rothschild's mother, uh, Betty Batya, we're going to see he names a community after her. She is more interested in Judaism. She teaches her children about Judaism. And he supports Zionism. Um, and the phrase, it doesn't sound as good in English, put it on the baron's account. In modern Hebrew, there's a phrase, al cheshbon ha-baron, right? Uh, the, the rich guy is going to pay for it. And that's basically what everything is, is al cheshbon ha-baron. He's the guy who comes in with the money. He has conditions. We'll talk about that in a second, OK? Uh, but he comes in with the money. In the beginning, he wants to be anonymous. But of course, there are very few people who have money, right? It's Rothschild and Montefiore. The, the, those are the only ones who could possibly give the money. So he's known as the well-known benefactor, Hanadiv Hayadua. And in fact, the beautiful gardens right near Zichron Yaakov, where he's buried, this is his grave and his wife's grave over here in the center of the garden on the, in the picture on the right, um, it's called Ramat Hanadiv, right? The, the heights of the, of the benefactor, but everybody knew who he was. Um, this is on the gates of Ramat Hanadiv. We have the, uh, the Rothschild um, 
his family's insignia uh, with their family motto, Concordia, Concordia Integritas Industria. Um, now, he is very open with his purse strings, but he comes with a lot of conditions, okay? He is a businessman. He is not just gonna write blank checks. He sends his own overseers. He decides what crops are going to be done, uh, are gonna be grown. And ultimately there's a lot of conflict, not necessarily between the baron and the settlers, but between the overseers and, and the settlers. Uh, and ultimately, he, he decides that the settlers have to be independent and he creates this organization, the Jewish colonization organization, and he puts it in the hands of the actual colonists. But the, the Baron is the reason that these, these communities don't die of starvation. Uh, he lays the economic foundations for later development. He starts other communities of his own initiative. He doesn't just save the ones that were started besides him. Um, and he names a lot of places after his family. Uh, Wikipedia estimates, and I'm not sure where they get this figure from, but it's a great figure, that uh, Baron Rothschild spent over $50 million uh, on the Moshe boat. That's, that's pretty impressive. Um, now, we said he's making the business decisions, uh, and partly because he's a Frenchman and partly because this is really a natural crop for the land of Israel, even though it had been neglected for centuries upon centuries. Uh, but the de decision is to make wine to grow grapes, to make wine. And this is the beginning of the first real industry, the first real Zionist industry, the Carmel Mizrahi Winery, which has branch in Rishon Lezion. It has a branch in Zichron Yaakov. Now it, it, makes a very, it, it makes a lot of sense because wine was always made in the land of Israel. It was only in the years of the Muslim conquest because Muslims are not allowed to consume alcohol that winemaking kind of fell apart. But really winemaking was the industry of the land of Israel, wine and olive oil. And that's what the Baron returns to. Now, another, the famous early communities, Zichorn Yaakov, right? Up the coast from Rishon, not far from Caesarea. Um, Romanian settlers this time, not Russian. They purchased land, uh, a place called Zamarin. Um, they think it's good farmland. They get there. They are rather disappointed. It's an eight-hour journey by uh, ox and wagon from Haifa. They get up to the top of the hill. If you know Zichron, it's right today in a beautiful, it's always been in a beautiful spot on the top of the hill looking out on the Mediterranean. Um, but when they get there, there's no water. There's a lot of snakes. There are some Arabs who are not particularly friendly. There's disease. Children die. Things are not good, right? And again, the Baron steps in to save them. And that's the pictures that you're seeing here are from the later development, okay? This is the synagogue, beautiful synagogue, 1886. The community is established in 1882. By 1886, they're sufficiently on their feet that they can build this beautiful synagogue. By the way, all of these first Aliyah communities, the synagogue is centrally located, very important. Um, this is These are religious communities. They're next generation, not so much, but the first generation is. Uh, and the other picture here is of uh, Brechat Binyamin, right? Um, Binyamin, as in uh, Edmund de Rothschild's Hebrew name is Binyamin. Uh, and that's why Binyamina to the south of Zichron Yaakov is named after him. Zichron Yaakov, by the way, is named after his father, Okay, Jacob, um, Azkarat Batya is named after his mother, Givat Ada is named after his wife. His names are all over the place. But this is, uh, this is the water, okay? the water that came here from the winery and underground aqueduct. Uh, and this is where people of the town came to get their water. And he really is the one who steps in and saves them. And that's why when you drive into Zichron Yaakov, you will see the Baron prominently displayed on the water tower. Um, but one of the ways to really understand what's going on between the settlers and the Baron's overseer is to take a look at the building on the right. Okay, today, this is the first Aliyah Museum. Wonderful, wonderful museum. Really a beautiful uh, way of showing all these different stories that we're talking about. Um, and you can see it's a gorgeous building. This was the home of the overseer of Zichron Yaakov, okay? Everybody's living in shacks. This is where the overseer is living. So definitely socioeconomic differences, religious differences. These guys are coming from France. They are rarely religious. They are not particularly interested in the religious needs uh, of the settlers. Uh, and they are really 
pushing the baron originally pushes them to buy the land to make the settlers give the land over to the baron they, they refuse as we said ultimately these conflicts are resolved but but it takes a while once we're in Zichron Yaakov to talk about one other story that's not a first aliyah story but it's partly a first aliyah story one of these first families right these pioneering families uh, is the uh, the Aronson family uh, Malka and Ephraim Aronson Malka actually has is has the first baby in Zichron Yaakov she doesn't actually have it in Zichron Yaakov uh, she is put on a wagon to be taken on a bumpy road to Haifa. You can imagine she has it before she gets to Haifa. Okay, but this is the first baby, Aaron, her child. Uh, that's uh, Aaron is this guy over here in the foreground. Uh, he's very famous because he was a scientist who discovered wild wheat, right? He discovered the original wheat before all the different uh, genetic mutations and changes. And that's why on the Aronson house, the insignia of the Aronsons is this wheat, okay? Uh, but that's not why they're famous. They're famous because they were spies, okay? The first really serious spy network in the land of Israel, Nili, Netzach Israel, Lo Yishaker, uh, today very lauded and even romanticized, but in the time that they were acting Active, everybody was very against them. They felt like they're stirring up trouble and the Turks are going to come after the whole community and they were really ostracized. And some people even think that uh, Sarah Aronson, who was, uh, who was discovered and tortured and eventually died uh, because of the Turks, she kills herself, but she's taken into prison by the Turks. Some people think she was given up by the people of Zichorn Yaakov, right? What is Nili? Nili is an acronym for Netzach Israel Lo Yishaker, the eternal of Israel will never be fought. Um, this is during World War I, when they see the British are coming in and they want to get rid of the Turks. Everybody wants to get rid of the Turks. The Turks are brutal and violent and, and terrible to the Jews. As much as the British are hardly good to the Jews, they are wonderful compared to the Turks. Um, and they decide they're going to help the British war effort by collecting all kinds of intelligence and information and passing it on to the British. At first, the British don't trust them. Eventually, they do. Um, it's not just the Aronson family, although they are very key. Aron uh, and uh, and his sister Sarah and sister Rifka. This is Sarah over here. Uh, but there are others from the outside, uh, Avshalom Feinberg, Yosef Lishansky, right, who come in to help. Basically, their major downfall is how to get the information to the British. Right? At first, they try to leave it uh, in an experimental uh, agricultural station by Atlit, and British ships pick it up every once in a while. That becomes too dangerous. Avshalom and Yosef Lashansky go down to Egypt to bring it to, uh, to the British and they're set upon by Bedouins and Avshalom is murdered. Ultimately, they use carrier pigeons and that leads to the downfall of the whole organization because one of the pigeons is captured by the Turks and carrier pigeons, you know, homing pigeons, they go home. So they follow this pigeon home and they find Sarah Aronson, who's the only one who is kind of keeping the thing, the home fires burning. She's captured by them. She's tortured. She commits suicide. This is her grave in uh, in the cemetery in Zichron Yaakov. So very, very important story and today coming to light really how much the British victory in World War One was due to the intelligence that they got from Neely but not recognized for a very long time. Um, okay one last community to talk about um, and that's Muscaret Batia. Okay, these communities we've mentioned already, Rishon Metzion, Zichron Yaakov, Gedera, they are um, initiated by the first Aliyah settlers. But Rav Mohiliver, remember him, right, from Chovavet Zion, he convinces Rothschild to create a new settlement, right, created by Rothschild. And Rothschild says, wonderful, very nice, but enough of these people who don't know anything about farming. I want real farmers. I want them to be trained. I want them to know what they're doing. So fine, Mohiliver agrees. Uh, and he, um, he sends his representative, somebody named Yechiel Brill, and he goes to a small village in Russia called Pavlova. And he holds a meeting, right? A parlor meeting. Who wants to come and move to the land of Israel and start an agricultural settlement? And at the end, when he has everybody come and, you know, if you want to come, sign up, come and meet me, he makes sure to shake everybody's hand, every man who's there, because obviously it's all men, right? He makes sure to shake all their hands. Why? Because he wants to see if your hands are nice and smooth, like Chaim Chisim's were from all your intellectual things thinking? Or are your hands good and rough because you're a good farmer and a good worker? And he chooses the ones whose hands are good and rough and they really are farmers. He chooses 10. They come to the train station the day they're supposed to leave. 
and he sees there are 11, right? 11 men and their families. He says, well, why 11? He says, you know what? We're a religious community. We need a minion. If one guy gets sick, we need an extra, right? We need a spare. Um, and they come to the land of Israel. First, they are in uh, in Mikveh, in Mikveh Israel. They choose their land, and then they move to this place that originally is called Ekron, okay? They thought it was the Ekron of the Bible. It's not. Uh, the Baron comes to visit, and he's so impressed with their industriousness and their modesty that he says, oh, I'm going to name it after my mother, who I don't think would have felt so comfortable here based on this beautiful portrait of her by Ingre. Uh, I don't know how she would have felt as a, as a pioneer, but the, the community was named after her, Maskeret Batya. Um, and this is some of the, you can see it today, it's actually beautifully restored. Um, you can see the synagogue and the special well that they have bringing up water from the ground and spilling it into a big pool uh, and the Baron's gardens. Okay? But Maskeret Batya really brings us to uh, one of the major issues of the first Aliyah, and that is the question of Shemitah, right? The sabbatical year. The Torah says, every seven years, you have to not work the land. Now, the Shemitah year, the first Shemitah year in modern times, right, in modern Zionism is 1881, 1882. Eh, not enough people here for it to make a difference. But 1888 is going to be Shemitah again, right? fall of 1888, Tishrei 1888. And the farmers in Gadeira already are starting to think about this and starting to ask questions. And they're saying, you know, we've just gotten on our feet. We were literally on the brink of starvation. Rothschild comes along and saves us. Can we really not work the land for an entire year? Everything that we have achieved is going to just go down the drain, not to mention the fact that we're all going to starve. What should we do? Now, there aren't, they don't turn to the rabbis in Jerusalem, which is perhaps their mistake. Instead, they turn to the rabbis in Chutzlaris. They turn to the rabbis in Europe and they turn to one of the greatest rabbis, right? Uh, Rav Yitzchak Elchanan Specter, the rabbi of Kovna, uh, who is known to support Jewish settlement, to support Chavav Etzion, but he's also a, a very great rabbinic thinker. And they say, what should we do? And he, looks at all of the situation that's going on and he determines that they really cannot stop working the land for a full year and he creates something that is still used this mechanism is still used today and it's called the heter mechira right and let's read what he says just an ex excerpt from what he says okay um this is a letter that he wrote as the shemitah year is approaching if we forbid working the land, the colonies will be destroyed and hundreds will die of starvation. In order to save these souls and to save the settlement project, to save body and money, we have found a way to permit work for this year, 5649, by selling the land and the vineyards to non-Jews with the condition that they are returned after the sabbatical year when we return the deposit money, right? A little bit like selling your chametz, not exactly, right? The land, if it's not owned by Jews, can be can be worked because it's owned by non-Jews. Obviously, those colonists who can hire non-Jewish workers to farm the land should do so, but the poor may work the land themselves based on the rulings of the rabbinical court in Jerusalem, based on the rulings of the rabbinical court in Jerusalem, very important caveat. All this is said only about the upcoming sabbatical year, not for others that will follow it, also important caveat. This is not a ruling forever, this is for this year, okay? And this is what Rav Yitzchak Elchanan Specter says, you have a way out, you can continue to work the land. Most of the communities agree with this, but he says it's based on the approval of the old Yishuv rabbis in Jerusalem and the old Yishuv rabbis are incensed. Absolutely not. There is no way we do not approve no way we can do this, okay? The Ashkenazi rabbis, the Spartan, by the way, say it's fine. Um, the Baron says, you don't work the land, you're lazy, I'm withdrawing all my support. And all of the communities essentially capitulate and follow the Heter Mechira, despite the fact that the rabbis of Jerusalem do not accept it, except for Maskeret Batya. Maskeret Batya says, we are following the rabbis of the old Yishuv. We are not doing this Heter Mechira. We are not going to do this selling of the land and we are not going to work the land. And they really are on the brink of starvation. They get some help from Jerusalem, uh, the Vad HaShemitah, the Shemitah Commission collects money for them, but the Baron cuts them off, right? Uh, and they become 
the standard bearers for Shemitah observance. Now, just to give one other perspective, we can understand Rav Yitzchak Elchanan Specter because they're in a terrible state. They're going to lose everything they've gained. But just to understand another approach, the Nitziv, Rav Natali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, who also supports settling the land, who is also a Zionist rabbi and in many ways a very modern rabbi. Um, uh, and at first he agrees, but then he says, no, no, at what cost, right? Uh, and he writes his own letter and he says, the land of Israel is still holy today. And the spirit of the Torah is why it survives. Just like the existence of Israel among the nations is because of keeping the Torah. A piece of land is not the reason for our survival. Judaism is our land and our existence. We must understand that we are not here to settle the land of the Philistines, but to settle souls in the land holy to God and to Israel, his people. Now, this is a, a fundamental question. We want a Jewish state. We want to the greatest extent possible to follow Jewish law. Is this viable? Is this possible? And it's not only about Shemitah. It's about keeping Shabbat and having the army running and the, and the hospitals running. It's about the Jewish character of the state. It's so many questions. The Shemitah controversy revives again in 1910 with Rav Cook. Eh? Um, and it's still, by the way, a, an issue and a question today. So it, it has hardly uh, dropped off the map. And certainly this question of are we a Jewish state or a state of the Jews is a very, very big question still. Um, but let's move on from that. Maybe we'll come back to it a little next time. Um, besides all the other dangers like starvation, we have other problems here. We have swamps, we have malaria, we have mosquitoes. There's a very high mortality rate, especially among children. Chadera, which is one of the swampiest and the most dangerous places, uh, out of 540 original settlers, 210 of them die, right? It is a horrible, horrible statistics. Um, and there's a need to drain the swamps so as to get rid of the mosquitoes so that there won't be malaria. And that, of course, is the famous story of the eucalyptus trees. Why are Australian trees thriving in the land of Israel? Because they were brought in to drain the swamps. Did they work? Eh, partly, right? <laughs> That's more of a botany question. Another question um, is, are we idealistic enough? Okay, and, and here is a fascinating thinker named Achad Ha'am. Achad Ha'am is most definitely not a political Zionist. He's not even a particularly practical Zionist. He is, by the way, his, uh, his original name is Asher Tzvi Ginsburg, uh, and he's what we call a cultural Zionist. He comes on a trip to the land of Israel uh, in 1889, and he's very disturbed by what he sees. Everything has become too bourgeois. Okay? There are Arab workers who are hired to work the land. There's no Jewish character to what's going on here. And he writes a very famous article called Lo Zohaderech, This Is Not The Way. Right, and uh, forget, I, I'll skip the joke for lack of time, but if people want to hear it later, I'll tell you. What wonder then that so great an ideal presented in so unworthy a form can no longer gain adherence, that a national building founded on the expectation of profit and self-interest falls to ruins when it becomes generally known that the expectation has not been realized and self-interest bids men keep away. This then is the wrong way. Seeing that these rumors are already there, we are not at liberty to neglect the task of mending and improving so far as we can. But at the same time, we must remember that it's not on these that we must base our hope of ultimate success. The heart of the people, the foundation on which the land, that is the foundation on which the land will be regenerated. And the people is broken into fragments. In some ways, Achad Ha'am is echoing the Nativ, right? It's not the land. It's not the physical land. We need to have a certain Jewish identity, a certain character. This has to be not just a physical refuge and perhaps not even a physical refuge, but an ideological refuge and Achad Ha'am Zionism, seeing the land of Israel and, and the Jews here as the cultural center and the spiritual center of the Jewish world, not necessarily the physical center of the Jewish world, that's a very important idea in Zionism as well. Okay, one little glimpse into the second Aliyah, but we'll, we'll spend more time on it next time. Um, the second Aliyah is short-lived, okay, 1904 to 1914. Um, it's cut off by World War I, which is a terrible crisis in the land of Israel. We'll talk about that last next time. But it's actually a very, very significant aliyah. Unlike the first aliyah, middle class, family, religious, the second aliyah is largely young people, single people, revolutionaries, right? Think about Europe, particularly Russia. Um, in, the, in the late 19th century, there are all sorts of isms, right? 
socialism, communism, Bundism, making the world a better place. These young people add to that Zionism. And they bring all these ideas of equality, whether it's wage equality or gender equality, not so much for everybody, but uh, as you can see here, the Chavat Alamot, the, the maiden's farm, the girl's farm over here in Daganya on the right, okay? Um, work as redemption, a universal language, a lot of the founding ideas, the really important ideas of, of Israel and of Zionism come from the second Aliyah, universal health care, self-defense, uh, the, the Kupat Cholim, uh, right, uh, the Shomer, labor unions, all different kinds of, um, of new ideas. And, and I'll sum it up by, by two fascinating quotes, okay, uh, from really two important people of the second Aliyah. Uh, most of these people are coming from religious homes, but they are leaving them behind, right? They have religious background, they know the yeshiva, they know the holidays, they know Hebrew and Yiddish, but they want to create something new. And one of those, the people who expresses this best is a young author who comes with the second Aliyah, whose name is Shai Agnon, eventually he wins the Nobel Prize for literature in Hebrew, and he writes a book called Tmol Shilshom yesterday. In those days, Jaffa was full of young fellows who had studied Talmud and had practiced exegesis. And when they gathered together and their heart would assail them, they would sweeten their sitting with Hasidic stories and Hasidic tunes or homilies. The generation before them sang songs of Zion. For this generation, these songs became trite. And when the yearning soul yearned, it went back to seek what was lost. Anyone who could sing sang tunes he had brought with him from his homeland. Anyone who could tell tales sat and sold tales told tales. The Lithuanians who don't know the Hasids pretend to be preachers. And here a thing happened that did not happen to their fathers. The sons of Miknagdim found delight in Hasidic tales. The sons of the Hasidim found delight in homilies. And they didn't distinguish between the imitation and the original because of the desire to exalt the soul. Out of their affection for those things whose tang is mostly in Yiddish, they sometimes gave up Hebrew on condition that the things were not said in public. In a small party of friends, they weren't sticklers about their language. They're creating this new world, but their feet are firmly in the old world, and, and they're a bridge between those two. And, and I'll finish with a quote from somebody who we'll talk about again next time, and that, of course, is Rav Avraham Yitzchak HaKohen Cook, a brilliant, brilliant Torah scholar who, uh, who has a revolutionary spirit, and he sees the revolution of these young people, and he says, take that spirit of revolution, of making the world a better place, all those isms, and apply it to Judaism because Judaism is really all the answers that you're looking for can be found there, but Judaism also needs to be renewed. And the most famous thing he said is the, is the quote here on top, Hayashan yitchadesh v'achadash yitkadesh. The old shall be renewed and the new shall be sanctified. And he writes a seminal article called Hador, the generation. And this is just a quote from it. Our generation is a magnificent generation, a generation that is full of wonder. It is hard to find its like in our history. It is made up of opposites. Light and dark are mixed together. It is low and downtrodden, high and lifted up. It is wholly guilty, also wholly innocent. The hearts of the father will begin to see the treasures of good and the hidden specialness in the sons, in the depths of their living and awoken souls. The sons will see the holiness and purity, the glory and grandeur that fill the hearts of the fathers who have kept them as an inheritance for generations. It is only through the spiritual uniting of young Israel with old Israel that the redemption will come. And we'll come back to that next time when we talk about uh, the influence of the second Aliyah uh, on the land of Israel, as well as a little bit of politics. Okay, what questions do we have here? Let us see. Uh, there's a beautiful new book on 800 years of proto-Zionist Eretz Chemdat Davot. Thank you. That sounds fascinating. Nechemi Levi, oh, Nechemi Levi was killed in the terror attack. Yes. Um, Eretz Chemdat Avot. Okay, look out for it. What was the population before each wave in Israel and Palestine? Okay, so we, we talked a little about that, right? The Jewish population, 19th century population is very, very small, right? We, we really do not have large numbers. It, it jumps greatly uh, by the time we get to World War I. All we see is the flag. I don't know what that means, but I'm sorry. I hope you saw everything afterwards. Okay, we not all stayed from first Aliyah. In Canada, people also went back to Europe, uh, but less so once robust social safety nets were created. Yes, uh, but here, I think in Canada, it was slightly less primitive <laughs> than it was here. Um, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing. Um, what is this? What did you not see? Can someone explain to me what you didn't see? 
I don't know. How much did Herzl really know? He was unaware of Pinsker's auto, auto emancipation. I don't know if he was unaware, but Herzl, we'll, we'll tell Herzl's story a little next time because uh, I really didn't uh, talk about him here. He was a very, very assimilated Jew. He was not particularly interested in Judaism and certainly not in any kind of a Jewish state. Um, and he's a young man. And as a young man, you know, he thinks he knows everything. Does he know about auto emancipation? I, I, I would not say that he didn't know about it, but he felt he wanted to create his own. And the book is really very different, right? The Jewish state really is, is coming from a different direction uh, than where Pinsker is coming from. Um, as Jewish population numbers grow, so do Arab numbers. As the Jews created employment opportunities, both directly, the economy grows and the Arabs came from outside. True, but nothing is like Jewish emigration. Much, much greater numbers. Um, what kind of work did the Beeler settlers do? What did all these guys do? They were farmers, right? They're farmers, not always successful farmers, but farmers. Um, why was it a mistake not to approach the Jerusalem rabbis? I I'm wondering if they would have been different if they had been approached first. That, that's just a conjecture. I'm not sure if that's true, but it's a conjecture. Uh, the Jerusalem rabbis denied the Heter Mechira. Um, look, the Jerusalem rabbis denied, we're not exactly living off the fat of the land. We say the Chalukah, that was a very little bit of money. <laughs> it was a pittance of money. I'm not sure if they didn't understand the farmer's plight. I think you have to look also at what the Nitziv is saying. I think that's a powerful argument. Okay, language. Language we're gonna talk about next time. Do not worry. Uh, but basically the short answer to your question is, Wherever they came from, that's the language that they spoke. Okay? Uh, beginnings of Hebrew, but uh, Hebrew is only beginning with the first Aliyah, with Eliezer ben Yehuda. Um, I'm sorry you did not see the pictures, Susanna, but you can see the recording. Where is Masker Batya? Masker Batya is um, not far from Rehovot, not far from Rishon Litzion, uh, center of the country. Um, how did the Arabs come to own the land? They were around for a much longer time than everybody else. That's basically the, the short answer. Um, there is a great book about Shemitah and Masker Batya. Uh, Batya, do you remember the name of the book? I have it here on my shelf. I just don't remember the name of the author. Um, I could turn around and look, but meanwhile, does anybody have any other questions or comments? It's Sam, it's Sam Frankel's book, I think, Rebels in the Holy Land. I have it. My yes, yes, Rebels in the Holy Land. Thank you. Yes. yes, this this fellow did a ton of research into the whole Shemitah story. Very, very interesting. If you are interested, this is the book to get. Rebels in the Holy Land, Sam Frankel or Finkel? I'm not sure. I have it in the other room. <laughs> I also have it behind me, but I can't see it. Um, Google Rebels in the Holy Land. Okay, thank you, everybody. Next week, we will not be having class because it is Yom HaTzmoet. Is there a good book on the Turkish period in Palestine? Mm, that's a very large question. I don't know if I have a great, I mean, I think the Shemitah book is excellent. Um, and then there are general history books. I don't know if there's anything that I can think of that is specifically about this time period. Um, but if I do, I will I will think of it next week. Okay, so next week we are off. Week after we are back on. Um, thank you, everybody. And uh, see you in two weeks. Happy Yom Atzmot. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. Are you aware of Shlomo Avineri's book on Herzl? My, my grandson actually gave me the book and he- Oh, he, I don't know that book. Can you put it in the frame more so I see Herzl's vision, I assume translated. Yes, by Shlomo Avineri. And he, it's based on Herzl's diary. Oh, interesting. Thank that you. That's okay. something to look into. Did you like it? Um, yeah, I haven't finished it, but it's, that's where I got the idea from about auto emancipation that Herzl in his diary said that if he had read Pinsker's book, he wouldn't have written his book. Ah, okay. So thank you. So you yeah. know that he didn't, that he wasn't aware of it. That's so interesting. But, but so that's I didn't so, know that. I mean, his grandfather might have been aware, but that's, he's two generations away. No, the grandfather the knew uh, Alkali. But I don't know if he, knew, but he wasn't the time period of Pinsker. Pinsker and Herzl are more or less contemporaries. Herzl's a little younger. Um, but I still think it's a different focus. As I, you know, maybe he's being modest that he wouldn't have written it. I'm not sure. But anyway, thank you for telling me about that. Is Sam, you said there was a joke that you didn't say. <laughs> oh, a joke. You stuck around for the joke? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you know how, 
uh, Jewish authors are often called not by their names, but by their books, right? So instead of saying Rav Yosef Kara, you'll say the Shulchan Aruch, right? The Torah Tamima. So uh, places are often named, streets are often named after these books, right? So somebody, so there's of course an Achad Ha'am street in Tel Aviv as well as in Jerusalem. And some people say, well, they should have really called it Lozo Haderech. This is not the way, which would have been a very funny name for a street. Was it worth sticking around for? Yes. yes. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.